Grace to you and peace from Jesus Christ our Savior and from God our Father. Amen. Well, today I'd like to talk to you for a few minutes about the steadfast love of God for us. Do you believe that God loves you steadfastly for the steadfast love? You know, we might doubt that sometimes when we think, you know, God certainly loved the great saints of old with a steadfast love, like David and Jeremiah and Moses or Peter or James or Paul. Of course God would love them. They were great. But what about me? I'm not so great. I'm weak. I fail. I fumble. I falter. I have trouble sometimes walking along. I'm the life that God has for me, I'm just a little person. Just a little tiny speck in the great world. I'm not like these great pillars of the faith. I understand God loving them, but why could I be sure that God would have a steadfast love for me? Do you believe that today? That God has the same steadfast love for you that he had for David? Well, let's take a look and see what God tells us about that in the scripture for our encouragement, because he wants to speak to you today through me about that very thing. Steadfast love, his heart toward us in Jesus Christ. So if we think about the Old Testament saints, David, Jeremiah, Noah, and all these people, were they really great? Actually, if you look at it, they were great, super people of faith. If you look at Abraham, for example, in uh, Genesis 18 there, when God was going to strike Sodom and Gomorrah, Abraham stands before the Lord and he says, Wilt thou indeed destroy the righteous with the wicked? Far be it from you to destroy the righteous from, with the wicked. If you find 50 righteous in that town, will you destroy it? The Lord says, For the sake of the 50, I will let it live. You know, So Abraham is the father of the faithful. Was he great? Absolutely. A hero of the faith. If you look at another one of the olds, ones here. You look at, uh, in this case, Moses. Anybody, can you, can you say this of yourself? It says, Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord drove back the sea by a strong east wind all night, and made the sea dry land, and the waters were divided. Anybody done that here? <laughs> Gone out to the, uh, you know, ocean over here, and stretch out your hand and part the ocean. Well, Moses could do it. Of course God would go love a, a man like that. But what about you and me? You look at Noah, that we read here in Hebrews, uh, chapter 11. It says, uh, turn over here quickly. Verse, uh, chapter 11, verse 7, it says, Noah, being warned by God concerning events as yet unseen, took heed and constructed an ark for the saving of his household. Uh, and by this he became an heir of the righteousness which comes by faith. That is a great man, Amen. The ark was 450 feet long, 75 feet on the beam wide, 45 feet high. He was a great man. Of course, God would love Noah. And Jacob wrestled with the Lord all night. Remember, in the middle of the night, that stranger came. It was the Lord who wrestled with him. And in the, as the break of day was coming, the Lord blessed him and said, No longer Jacob shall be your name, but Israel, for you have striven with God and prevailed. And he gave him the blessing. Of course God would love Jacob. He was great. David, anybody stood up against a giant nine feet tall? That's to the top of that grating there, by the way. Imagine that. I defy the ranks of Israel this day. Give us a man that we may fight together, says Goliath. And David says, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? And he struck him down and delivered Israel from the hand of their enemies. Of course God would love a man like David because he struck down the giant, right? But what about you and me? If you look at uh, Jeremiah, he stood against the whole city and proclaimed the word of the Lord in the face of great opposition. Gideon, with 300 men, vested upwards of 300,000 with just lanterns and a few trumpets. John the Baptist, whom we're looking at in the Advent season especially, Jesus said, of all those who have been born of women, none greater than John. He was great. Peter, James, and John, they, they preached, and they got 3,000 people in a single sermon. I haven't done that. I'm happy if I get one or two. <coughs> Paul, he worked harder than any of them. He had a mission to the Gentiles, at risk of life and limb everywhere he went, 
and brought the gospel to the world, of course God would love Paul. Because look what he did. He was so great, so we think. But what about you and me? Well, let's think about this for a moment. Did God love all these people with a steadfast love? He sure did. Look at Abraham. Fear not, Abraham. Your reward shall be very great. I'm your shield. He looks over there to Noah and says, Noah, you've found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Moses, but I will be with you, Moses. I'll go with you to Pharaoh. I'll do these works through you. Jacob, he said to him, uh, Behold, I've given you. I'm with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land. I won't leave you, Jacob, until I've accomplished all that I've promised and spoken to you. God anointed David as king, and he says in Isaiah 55, verse 3, My steadfast, sure love for David. Would you like God to say that to you? My steadfast, sure love for Bill. My steadfast, sure love for Karen. My steadfast, sure love for Gwyn. Yeah, I caught you, see? You're looking over there. <laughs> <laughs> Does God have a steadfast love for you like this? To Jeremiah, he said, The Lord is with you as a dread warrior. Gideon, behold, you mighty man of valor, valor, he said to him. When John the Baptist was killed, remember, Jesus withdrew and went off to a place by himself to weep after he heard of his friend John having been killed. Paul, don't be afraid, Paul, and speak and don't be silent, for I am with you. No man shall be able to attack you or harm you, for I have many people in this city. God sure loved him. Peter, James, and John. Let's open up and read this one in John 13, verse 1. Listen carefully. It says, Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew his hour had come to depart out of the world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Say the word love. love. Did God love all these people with a steadfast love? What are we talking about today? It's not just love like I love pizza or I love to go for a walk. The word in the Bible is chesed. You have to say it like that, like a Hebrew. Chesed in the Old Testament, where you'll find it in words like uh, 1 Chronicles 16. Oh, give thanks to the Lord for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Psalm 33. Let thy steadfast love, O Lord, be upon us, even as we hope in thee. What is God's steadfast love to these saints? What does chesed mean? It's not just love. It is zealous love. Think about that. It is energetic love. It is favor, kindness, and mercy. It's loyal love, meaning it's unfailing faithfulness, unchanging mercy. Enduring love, meaning uh, steadfast. It's not like a shifting sand or a changing shadow. It's constant, like the North Star, ever fixed. This is the kind of love that God had for David, for Jeremiah, for Abraham, for Moses, for Peter, for Paul, and for John. I don't want to ask you a question. Does God have that same steadfast love for you personally? Speaking to each and every one individual here, does God have that same love for you in Christ? Well, we might think, not really. I'm not sure of it because, man, these guys, they were great. They were super. They were heroes. They were monumental, right? They were terrific. They parted the sea. They conquered 10,000 armies, uh, defeated giants, worked miracles. Of course God would love them, but who am I? I work at Walmart, right? I'm a flea. I'm a little speck in the vast earth underneath this great sky and space and stars. I just a little guy. Trip and falter and such. And they seem so big, right? Don't the saints seem huge to you? All these guys I've mentioned? Can you compare with them? You go to these churches, right? And they're like 20 feet tall, stained glass. There's Paul. And there's Peter. And there's Elijah. And you're like, oh, I'll never compare with them, right? When I was at seminary in St. Louis, uh, you come outside the class, middle winter, you can picture the snow, and it's very chilly there in St. Louis. And what do you see outside of one of the buildings? The statue of Martin Luther. And this guy's not Martin Luther, it's Martin Luther, right? 
I mean, he's like 10 feet tall, bronze statue, and then he's on like this, this stone base that's like five feet tall. So you want to see Luther? You're like at 15 feet to see the guy. No matter what the weather is, whether it's snowy or the blast of summer, it's heat or snow or winter, whatever it is, rain or shine, he stands looking out to some distant horizon with his hand upon his Bible, ready to preach. And you're like, man, I can never be like this guy, right? <laughs> Otherworldly. He's so high. I'm just a little, little tiny dot. Would God really love me? Well, let's take a look at this question next. How great were these saints that we've all mentioned so far? David, Jeremiah, and all these, uh, Moses, etc. Were they great? You tell me. Yes, these are Hall of Fame, amazing. They had their moments of sun and shining like the stars, doing amazing things. And they walked by faith. But were they otherworldly, perfect, beyond human? My goodness, when you look upon them in closer inspection, these people that are in stained glass, they got a lot of stains. <laughs> let's take a look, for example. Let's look at Abraham. Girls, or women, put it that way. You tell me what you think of him in this case. There was a famine in the land, and Abraham went out down to Egypt to sojourn there, for the famine was severe in the land. And when he was about to enter Egypt, and he said to Sarai, his wife, I know that you're a woman very beautiful to behold. And when the Egyptians see you, they'll say, this is his wife. Then they'll kill me, but they'll let you live. So say you are my sister, that it may go well with me because of you that my life may be scared, spared on your account. Does that impress you? Nice if you go out to a bar and your husband says, tell them I'm just your sister. I mean, I'm your brother. <laughs> well, it's the modern world. Maybe you could say I'm a sister. <laughs> yeah. I identify as a sister or something like that. Whatever. Would that impress you? The man was afraid for his life. You'd think he should stand up for his wife come hell or high water, but he's afraid. He was a human being, is the point, just like you and me. Moses, though he did such great things, he struck the rock twice, and God banned him from entering the promised land on account of it. He sinned. Noah, who built the ark, as soon as it was over, and he had his first shore leave from the ship, and he gets ashore, he makes a vineyard, drinks the wine, gets drunk, and lay uncovered in his tent. That was a great shame. He wasn't perfect. Jacob, of course, he was great, but he lied in, to get the blessing and steal it from his brother. David, great, struck down the giant, but then he was struck down by Bathsheba, by her beauty, and he slept with her, an adulterer, and then had her husband put to death on the battlefield. Murder. Murder. Jeremiah was ready to throw in the towel, and he said, basically, God, kill me now. Gideon, he's like, God, I can't deliver Israel. Let me put you to the test, God. Is it good to test the Lord? <laughs> no. God went along with it. He finished the test, confirmed his faith, and what did Gideon do again? I need a second test, God. Put him to a test a second test. This guy is not perfect as great as he was. He had his sins. Lot, after he escapes from Sodom and Gomorrah, righteous Lot, he gets drunk, sleeps with his two daughters. And they have children who become what the Moabites and what other Ammonites, I think it was. Rahab, she was a harlot, but then she got saved. But, and Jonah, he ran in disobedience away from God as far as he could. John the Baptist, as great as he was, none greater, says Jesus, yet, after saying, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, a short time later he's in prison, and he's like, Send to Jesus and say, are you he who is to come, or shall we look for another? He began to doubt, because life had gotten very hard for him. He needed to be reassured. Peter and the other apostles denied the Lord at a, the time of his betrayal. Peter even calling down a curse. And one more, let's listen to Paul, what he says of his life in Acts 26. He says, I punished the Christians often in the synagogues and tried to make them blaspheme. And in raging fury against them, I persecuted them even to foreign cities. Would you say he was perfect? No. He was really a messed up, wrong-going, evildoer. 
at one time. But God had a steadfast, sure love for each of these. Do you think you might then possibly have hope that God could have a steadfast, sure love for you in Jesus Christ? Did God love these people? I'm going to ask you. You answer. Did God love these people because they were so great? Is that why he loved them? Or would they be great because he loved them? Think about this. All these people... Stained glass, they showed stains. You know, great pillars, they came falling down because they weren't perfect. They're like you and me. When I first came here, I'll just make a little confession to the church. When I first came here 13 years ago, you guys had a beautiful bust ahead of Luther. I don't know if you remember that. It was on one of the bookshelves over here. And while I'm moving furniture, when I moved, first moved here, I bumped it, and the head starts to wobble. <laughs> and then it starts to fall, and I go to reach it, and... <gasps> And the thing went into a thousand pieces on the floor. And I was like, well, that's a bust. <laughs> I just busted losers bust. They're going to bust me. I'm going to get busted for that. The bust bit the dust. <laughs> on closer inspection, all of these saints, great as they are, come down from their height on closer inspection, and they become just like you and me. They had their great shining moments, to be sure, but they're human beings like you and me, and God had a steadfast chesed, zealous, energetic, loyal, enduring, consistent love for them. Can you have hope that God loves you like that today? Yes. Amen? Yes. What then is our hope and foundation that he loves you like that? Well, the Old Testament saints, and then New Testament. They had the same hope as you and I have. They believed, and we believe, the hope is in the greatness of God. And not in our own greatness. Not in our own worthiness. But in God's super mercy called grace. Amen? Amen. That God has grace for sinners. To love them and to bring them out of His wrath through Christ into His love. His steadfast love. Do you think all the saints did this? Do you think they all looked to themselves for their own greatness? For God's love to them? Listen to this. Jacob in Genesis 32 says to God, God, I'm not worthy of the least of all this steadfast love and faithfulness which thou hast shown to thy servant. For with only my staff I crossed this Jordan and now I've become two companies. I'm not worthy of the least of all this steadfast love. Not worthy. Who did he look to? You tell me. To God and to his grace for steadfast love. Moses, though he was so great, it re read he was meek, more than all the men of the whole face of the earth. Meek, small, tiny, insignificant in his own eyes, humble. David says in Psalm 22, I am a worm and I'm no man, scorned by men and despised by the people. And you all know Paul. He says, I am the least of the apostles. Unfit to be called an apostle. Because I persecuted the church of God, but the grace by the grace of God I am what I am. Isn't that beautiful? So do you guys have hope today? That God loves you right now in this very instant, 2018, with a steadfast love? The same as he had for David, for Jeremiah, for Moses, for Elijah, for Peter, for Paul, and for you? you got to believe it. It's by the grace of the Lord. And Paul talks about this in his letter. Turn over here to 1 Timothy chapter 1. Paul says this of himself. He says, I formerly blasphemed Christ, persecuted, insulted him. But I received mercy because I acted ignorantly in unbelief, in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. So, according to these verses, what is the hope that Paul had? The grace of God, which overflowed. And picture Niagara Falls, right? Cataract, waterfall, tons of gallons flowing over to a terrible sinner. And what is it? Faith and love overflowed for me in Christ Jesus. Faith and love equals steadfast love, faithfulness and love. In Christ Jesus. 
The saying is sure and worthy of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. I'm the foremost, the chief of them, but I receive mercy for this reason. That in me as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display, put into public view for everybody, his perfect patience for an example to those who are to believe in him for eternal life. In other words, Paul says to you, if God can forgive someone like me and have steadfast love, he can have steadfast love to you. And it's by the grace of God in Christ. Amen? Amen. We read over here in, uh, in Jeremiah, he says, uh, Remember my affliction and my God, and my gall. My soul thinks of it. It's continually bowed down. But this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope that the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. You know, I think it's beautiful that the Holy Spirit has put into the Bible not only the great deeds of the saints, but also their terrible misdeeds as well. Don't you? Do you take courage by that? That you see that people committed adultery, committed murder, committed uh, lying and fear, and yet God had a steadfast love for them. And all these saints looked not to themselves, but to God for their help. David says, Create in me a clean heart, O God. Put a new and right spirit within me. Restore to me the joy of thy salvation. Uphold me with a willing spirit. They all point us to Jesus Christ and whom we can have steadfast love. Come out of wrath into the presence and the state of experiencing and being in the steadfast love of God for you. And we find this love for us in the gospel of Jesus Christ. 1 John 4 says this, In this is love, not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the expiation or the atoning sacrifice for our sins. It's not that you love God or that you conquered giants or that you preached a thousand sermons or that you built a hundred hospitals, though those are great things. It's not that we love God, but that He first loved us and sent His Son to to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. That is the foundation of God's love for you. Didn't all the saints of the Bible look to Jesus Christ for their love? Look at, for example, the sinful woman in Luke chapter 7. Probably a prostitute. All kinds of sins. She wept at Jesus' feet, washed them with her, with her tears, wiped them with her hair. And Jesus says, your sins are forgiven you. Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Where does she find steadfast love? In Jesus Christ. The sinful woman of John 8, caught in adultery. Neither do I condemn you, says Jesus, go and do not sin again. And her sorrow turned to joy. Where did she find steadfast love? In Jesus Christ. The jittery jailer in Acts chapter 16. Then what must I do to be saved? Believe in the Lord Jesus and you'll be saved, you and your household. And he believed, he rejoiced that he believed in God, says the scripture. Where did he find it? In Jesus Christ. If you're looking for steadfast love today, where are you going to look? Are you going to go out and meditate on a mountain? Are you going to go scratch your name into the sand over here and see if you get a sign? Are you going to put out a fleece? Or are you going to look to Jesus Christ where God has manifested, brought into full view, put out for display to everybody, I love you with a steadfast love. Come into Christ and you'll come into my steadfast love and live in it forever. Steadfast, never changing, unfailing, constant, steady. Luther himself was in a, he's a medieval mess. He was afraid of God, doubting. God, I don't know if you ever even love me. I don't understand you. Until he came to the gospel and he found it in Jesus Christ. And he said, I felt as if I entered through open gates into paradise. And it's the same thing with me. You know, I look at myself. Maybe you think I'm a great guy. I don't know. Maybe you don't. I look at myself and I think, not worthy. I'm, I'm not where I want to be. I'm a little tiny guy. Why would God love me? I understand these guys, but why me? Answer, what did I say? What did God say? The grace of God in Jesus Christ. Yes, Greg, he loves you. Yes, Cindy, he loves you. Yes, Bill, he loves you. Yes, Dick, he loves you. In Jesus Christ, 
It's, it's there for us all to see. And we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, following the desires of body and mind. Would you like me to shine a spotlight on you and see all your sins? And bring you up here and have you give an account of them? <laughs> but we were by nature children of wrath, says the Bible. But God, who is rich in mercy, out of the great love with which he loved us. Even when we were dead through our trespasses, God made us alive together with Christ. By grace you've been saved. And then he raised us up with him and made us sit with him in, his, in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. And God chose you in him before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless before him. And he destined us in love. Say love. love. He destined us in love for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace which he freely, freely bestowed on us in Christ to give us redemption and the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us. If I'm looking out on here, on you to now, right now, and I can see invisibly into the invisible realms, God in Christ pouring a Niagara Falls of steadfast love over all of his people. He wants us to lay hold of that, friend. Not going through our lives like a little girl with a daisy going, He loves me, He loves me not, He loves me, He loves me not. Never knowing whether one day He loves us or loves us not. Because we're thinking on our own goodness. One day we're great, one day we're horrible. But He wants us to say, No. Eyes away from yourselves, look on Jesus. Look on the cross, look on the gospel, look on my love for you there. And that, unlike a shifting shadow, Unlike changing sands of the sea, this is an ever-fixed star like Polaris, like that North Star, which remains ever-fixed, by which you can navigate across the seas, even in the middle of darkness and storms, for it's unchanging, unfailing, never ceasing to shine for you, the love of God for you in Jesus Christ the Savior. This is what God wants for you, and his promise is, Ephesians 2, he did all this so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. That's what he's got in his mind up there. In his heart revealed, I am going to show you my love for you in such amazing ways that it'll blow your socks off for all eternity. How much I love you. For God is love, says John, and in him there's no darkness at all. And we by his grace, through the cross, have come out of his wrath into his steadfast love. And now we can love others because he first loved us. Amen? Amen. So in conclusion, <laughs> as the end here, do you believe that God has a steadfast love for you? Yes. Yes. The same as David. The same as he had to Moses. <clears throat> the same as he had to Abraham. The same even as he had to Jesus Christ. For the Father has loved you even as he loved me says Jesus. And the saints, if they could speak to us now, would say, we're just like you. We even did worse things to make your mouths drop agape and for you to go, because we committed adultery. We had murder. We had lies. We had prostitution. We had stealing. We had all kinds of things. But the foundation for us is the same as for you. We're justified by faith in Jesus Christ, and you're justified by faith in Jesus Christ. And we have the same hope together, they all say. It's Jesus Christ. Paul says, may our minds be opened and our hearts to know the breadth, the length, the height, the depth, to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge. So deep it is. So I'll conclude with this word. In all these things, says Paul, we are more than conquerors. More than conquerors through him who loved us. For I'm sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor heights, nor depth, nor anything, anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.